Our speakers today are Police Chief Grant Buckskin and Inspector Ryan Nadger of the Blood Tribe Police Service. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Just to, just to begin with, I'll uh, introduce myself. I knew the technology and I don't really get along. <laughs> okay, Anistoano um, Nitsoketopi. That is my culture name that I was given when I was a child by my great grandfather. It translates roughly into Lone Rider. Um, I've been working with the Blood Tribe Police Service for 33 years now. I'm, I'm, I'm originally from the Blood Reserve. I was born and raised in a little community down by Cardston called Moses Lake. I left, I left home when I was 17. I went away to college and came back home. I had the opportunity to join the police service. I thought, okay, well, I'll do it for five years and you know, get a little experience and go back to school where I was gonna become a lawyer. But here I am 33 years later and what, what, was, good, what was gonna be a position just for the experiences now it turned into a career that I, don't, I, I honestly couldn't see myself doing anything else. Um, like I said, I've been here for 33 years. In, in policing itself, 23 with the Blood Tribe. I, I started there and I left. I've worked in central Alberta and northern Alberta and plenty of time out in Manitoba from Brandon West where I headed up the western division of the Manitoba First Nation Police Service. Um, and that's basically been my career. I've, I, I've done, you know, we've, I, I've been a shift supervisor, a sergeant. I've worked in our crime reduction unit, which consisted of battling the ongoing opioid crisis on the reserve, which is, which has also affected the city of Lethbridge. Um, so I've, I, I've, I've got some experience, I would say. And, uh, you'll, you'll have to forgive me a little bit. I'm, I'm not really big on public speaking. It's, I'm the guy that likes to just kind of sit in the back and let everybody else take the glory while I sit in the back and do my own thing and move everything along. But with that, I'll introduce uh, my inspector, Rayanne Najjar. I'll have him come up and he can give you a brief bio of himself. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the glory, so. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so my name is Rian Najjar. Um, a brief history about myself. I was born in Lebanon back in 84, and I came here in 91 with my family at the age of uh, seven. Um, bounced around all over Alberta from Olds to Milk River uh, down to here, Lethbridge, since 97. I'm a graduate of uh, Lethbridge Collegiate Institute um, and the Lethbridge College criminal justice program, and I've done 16 years of policing and all with the Blood Tribe Police Service. Um, I've, like similarly to the chief here, I did uh, some stints in our um, criminal investigation unit, general investigation unit, um, more on the um, complex investigations and the drugs, that's more his purview, I'm more on the investigational side of things. Um, I'm currently the uh, uh, administration support division inspector where I oversee policy, procedure, um, training, recruiting, and I also oversee uh, professional standards. So um, that's a little bit of myself, and I'll turn it back to the boss. Thank you, man. I'll get it yet. There we go. All right. One of our visions with Blood Tribe Police Service was to be a leader in First Nation policing. And that ran the gamut of everything. I mean, if, if there's an opportunity for us to start an initiative, and we'll, we, we will take that on. And you know, our, our, our hope is that once this initiative is started, other police services, not necessarily just First Nations police services, but all police First Nation, oh, sorry, but all police services look at it and are able to 
you know, call some stuff out of it and get some information that they can utilize. So that's one of the, and then, and, and, and I, I gotta throw, out as, throw this out as a caveat, but as, as a person from the Kainai Nation, from the Blood Reserve, historically we're a really proud people, right? And on the plains we weren't very well liked because we were almost looked at as being arrogant. So that's kind of carried over into our vision. <laughs> So, no, not, 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 not that we're arrogant. <laughs> Our mission statement is we are guided by the principle of Ganassini, which is the Blood Tribe Police Service maintains and enhances public safety while building a culturally, culturally appropriate police service. So that being said, we... We, we, we provide training and knowledge to our incoming officers, non-native and, and, and native as well, where we ingrain some of our culture and our, uh, and, and our customs that are specific to the blood reserve. So, you know, if they have a situation where they're needing to go somewhere and they're just not sure what to do, well, they can fall back on that. Or they can go to, you know, well, we're, we're, we're looking at starting an elders group now. I've had situations where I've gone into houses and some ceremonial artifacts are in the house. And I sat there and, I, and, and even I wasn't sure how I was supposed to broach that. So at that time I called an elder in and told him, hey, you know, I don't know what am I supposed to do here? What, what steps should I be taking? So we took care of that. So it was at that point I thought, okay, well, now we've got to start really looking at that. And, you know, I, I think we've done a good job to this point. Could it be better? Absolutely. Everything could be better. And, you know, it's like everything else. Everything evolves. So we're still continuing down that line. Now, just a quick little history on the Ganassini. It was a declaration was made many years ago establishing the tribal system that is in place today. Blood Tribe Police Service uses this as a guide in how it conducts its dealings with people we interact with. Under Kanasini, we maintain and initiate a sense of responsibility to our people and nation to continue to seek a better means of survival, to provide an orderly and accepted way of carrying on our culture with also holding ourselves responsible for carrying the trust of the people in our hands. Um, I, I know we have a little bit of a question period after, but this might get lost somewhere along the way. So if anybody has any questions or a clarification on it, right now would be a good time to ask. Nope, oh, okay. And our core values, anekoa, which is be respectful, kimapipitsini, which is be compassionate, and ikakimat, try your best, try hard, are what we serve our people with. We have, those are our values. When we go to a situation, that's what we fall back on, and that's what we look at as we're dealing, as we're going along in each situation. Currently, the Blood Tribe Police Service has 33 police officers. 75% of the police officers are indigenous, 25% of the police officers are women. And there are 27 civilians who are the backbone of our operation. And I've, I've, I've always said that. Um, when people look at a police service, this is what they look at. They see the vest, the uniform. I don't necessarily buy into that. When I look at my organization, I don't look at what your rank is or what you've done. Instead, I look at it as a totality. It doesn't matter. At, at the end of the day, we're all blood tribe police. And I value our civilian staff a lot. And I make sure that I let them know as often as I can just how important they are to our organization. <laughs> I also let my officers know so they don't feel left out. <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, we, we, we make sure that our civilian staff knows that they're appreciated as well. 
The Blood Tribe is the largest indigenous community in Canada, spanning, spanning well over 1,400 square, square kilometers and home to over 12,000 people. Our building is located in Standoff and we are fully autonomous. We have neighboring communities which include Lethbridge, Fort McLeod, Glenwood, Hill Spring, Cardston, and we are near the Waterton National Park. And I'm, I, I'm not sure if, any, if, if anybody's aware, but we do have some reserve land up near Waterton, close to the U.S. border, that we are also responsible for policing. And, and, that's, a, and that's a drive out there. I mean, it's 45 minutes from, well, actually, no, it'll be a little over an hour from our office. So it's quite a drive, and fortunately, we don't, get a whole lot of calls out there, but when we do, it's, it's a call. <laughs> uh, I just thought I'd throw our organizational chart in here. This is an old one because we're in the midst of a bit of a management change here. We will be looking at this again and, and fixing that up. But this just gives you a brief overview of how our organization, uh, organization looks. But again, like I said, this is something that we're probably going to dismantle and rebuild and find something that's not, not so cumbersome and a little more efficient. But again, like everything else, uh, we'll, we'll get to it soon. <laughs> now, when I was asked what we would speak about, I <coughs> thought about it and I was like, okay, well, what are our biggest challenges? And our biggest challenge right now is our funding program, our funding processes. We are part of our tripartite agreement, which includes the federal government, provincial government, and local leadership, meaning chief and council. Our funding is provided by the federal government at 52% and the provincial government at 48 The tribe itself supplies us the building and if we, if we have some kind of niche, initiative going on that we have not budgeted for, we will we'll approach the band and we will ask, we will provide them a business case and a budget and if we're fortunate enough, we'll, we'll get that assistance and, you know, nine, nine, nine times out of ten, we're going to get that assistance from the band. Now, these tripartite agreements are short-term short agreements. I remember, and it wasn't too long ago, we would enter into a five-year agreement, so we would not have to worry about funding for the next five years. However, now, it's at the 11th hour, we get a letter from the federal government, Public, Public Safety Canada. He always gets mad because I always say, it. I, I give it a different title. <laughs> so, I, so, so, I get, so I get corrected three, four times a day. I mean, sometimes I just do it, just, just because. <laughs> So yeah, so we enter into these short-term agreements and, 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 and they are a year in length. And we are not being treated fairly. And, you know, and that really became apparent in my stint right now as the chief of, as the chief of police. We're, we've asked, okay, let's get to the table and let's work something out. Let's get this longer terms going again. And we hear nothing, we hear crickets, crickets. They'll throw, us a, they'll throw us a few dollars. And you know what, good for them, because we're looking at you know, up, uh, updating some of our police equipment. And we had a $284,000 bill that we're looking at. And we sat there and we're like, oh, where are we gonna come up with this money? Now we're gonna have to start looking at cutting and finding where we're gonna get all this money. But we got fortunate enough, I, 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 I don't know what happened with the federal government, but all of a sudden they called us up one day and said, hey, what do you guys need? We have some money, we'll give you a one-time 
So, like I said, we managed to get lucky there. Very, very lucky, because yeah, we were looking at that and we're like, oh. So that took care of that, but the, the, the point is when we go and approach them, we do not hear anything from them. Last week I got a letter saying, okay, this is what you're getting, but it's only for one year. And further in the letter it says that they've been trying to get this meeting together so we can sit down and hammer this out, which is something that never occurred. We've, we've never been consulted, we've never been asked to go sit and meet with them. Instead, like I said, at the 11th hour, it's basically, here's your money for the year, take it or leave it. And that's, yeah, it, it, it gets a little disheartening, but I mean, we, we've been in existence for, you know, in, in, in my time, I started in 1990. And it's always been like that, but the Blood Tribe Police Service existed in some form prior to that. There was two, three different versions of it. This most current from, from when I started, and I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna take any that I was responsible for, but this is the longest, sir, this is the longest term that the Blood Tribe Police has been in operation. And that's just due to the hard work of all the members and officers and the leadership that has come along in that time. Um, another part of our funding is the dollars that are provided to us allocation-wise. Allocation right now we are at, we get funded for, per officer we get, a, we get funded at 211,000 an officer. This year, we're getting bumped up to, to 216,000. And I'm not sure about all the other First Nations across, across Canada or in Alberta, but I'm sure, I, I know for a fact that they are also severely underfunded. We're all, we're all in these tripartite agreements. You have other reserves like Northern Alberta or even be Gunny Brockett out of west of here who are referred to as a community tripartite agreement where the RCMP come in, they police that reserve. We're at two, we're at 216 now. RCMP, when they come on to reserve to police it, they're at two, 280,000. So there's this huge discrepancy. And you know that's that, that's one of the things that we're we're fighting for that 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 we need, and it's you know uh, 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 up to this point it's fallen on deaf ears, but we have some organizations that are fighting for us. Also, as part of the tripartite agreement, there are limitations on where that money can be spent. We 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 cannot use it towards you know, a mortgage towards a new building, which we are in dire need of. We're two and a half years away from having our, our current office condemned. So now we have this other thing right now where, okay, well, we're pushing the government and we've got everything in order. Now it's just sitting with them. We're waiting to see if they're going to provide us the funding. And, and, and the funding itself comes out of the, the program itself too. So. There, we're fighting other police serv other First Nation police services across Canada for that funding, because they need. You know, you have places up in northern Alberta who are, you know, they'll come to our place and they say, "Well, what are you guys mad about this building's state of the art?" <laughs> and we're like, "Well, it's the state of something, but it's not state of the art." <laughs> So yeah, you know, it's just it's things like that where the funding limitations. You know, you have you have that. You know, so even something as simple as okay, we get this tripartite agreement, and we're looking at it, and you know, we're not lawyers, so we we can't take that tripartite agreement, send it to a lawyer, have it reviewed, and come back and pay for it. We can't use 
that funding money to pay for a lawyer to look at. So then he gets kicked out of chief and council. And again, depending on the flavor of the day, we're either up here or we're down here. And historically, we're down here <laughs> in their big picture of importance. But I mean, it's, this is one of those things that you've, you've, you've kind of learned to live with and you keep pushing it as, as much as you can as you go along. Um, we do, we, we, we have MOUs with the RCMP for specialized services, which would include your, your canine, forensic evidence, their, their lab, the laboratory services. Um, what else am I missing? Pardon me? Oh, your, your tactical teams, your ERT, or if you watch a lot of TV, SWAT. <laughs> You know, these are the things that we have to rely on them for. Fortunately, they're pretty good about that. We, 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 we don't get much pushback from them. We're saying, okay, well, we got this going on and we, we can't make it there. Like, we, we, we recently had a uh, search warrant where we had to call out Earth because they. What we had was there was weapons and drugs and everything else inside the house, and we weren't comfortable sending our people in, so we called them, and that happened in really short order. Like, they were here within, I want to say, less than 24 hours from the time when we called them, and they got there. They had this other stuff going on, too, but they made it a point to come down right away, as quick as they could anyways. And so. You know, and, and, and this all comes down to the funding, all, all, all these little challenges. You know, money isn't the answer to everything, but whatever we can get helps. And, you know, um, never in my life have I been a frugal person until I took over this position. And <laughs> now I'm saying, um, first thing in the morning is, how much do we have? What's this going to cost? Do we really need it? Ah, oh. but. But my biggest fear is, as always, I'm, 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 I'm always watching our funds and making sure that we have everything. And now, just for some funding comparisons, like I said, with, with, with our current funding program with the tripartite agreements, the money is at a set, the funding is at a set level. Going, this year, we got a bit of an increase. Going into next year, I don't know if we're going to. I highly doubt it. So what I'm operating with this year is what we'll probably be operating with next year. So this just shows you quickly what, you know, some of, you know, if, if RCMP or Municipal Police Service needs that extra funding, well, this is what they can, these are the options they have along with the RCMP. We don't have, we, we don't have that luxury. We're at the mercy of the federal and provincial government on what we will be provided for to provide policing to the, to the nation. Um, staffing and retention, one of, another one of our bigger problems. First of all, there's that lack of interest in policing now. Um, I, was, I was listening to radio coming in and there was a retired officer talking and he was talking about he was out golfing with his father, who was also a retired, uh, retired police officer. If it was five years ago, and I've done this too, if it was five years ago, if somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? I would have said, I'm a police officer. That's what I do. And uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm proud of being a police officer. But nowadays, in today's climate, when people ask me what I do for a living, I just say, I'm an administrator with on our reserve, only because I do not want the headache of having to listen to somebody and getting blamed for something that you have one bad officer that did something, but we're all painted with the same brush now. So just to avoid that kind of conflict, I don't identify myself as a police officer, although my daughters do. <laughs> you go somewhere, it's like, oh, my dad's a police officer. Um, our service is all also almost looked at as a stepping stone. We'll get 
non-native officers and native officers who will come in, we'll train them, we'll get them specialized training. And once they get all that, they'll leave. And we're left going back to, all right, now we're gonna bring in a new recruit in. So we always run that risk. And that's always been an argument, but I was telling Rayanne here, I told him, well, I told him the time is now where we throw that stepping stone out. And now we really concentrate on retention. And that's another challenge, a whole different challenge. There's challenges within our challenges. Now, there's a lack of career progression because we're such a small service. Uh, cultural challenges is a, is, a, is a big one too because most people that come out here are not, haven't been exposed to life on the reservation and it's, uh, it's, it's different. Our, our resources are, are minimal. We get something, we hang on to it for dear life and we, and we take care of it as best we can because we're, we just don't know if we're gonna have the funds or the ability to replace anything. Policing our home community. I don't know how many times I've had to arrest relatives, cousins, uncles. Uh, no, I didn't pick up my nephew. <laughs> I was thinking, hey, there was. But yeah, I, I, like when I start when 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 I started, I, I let my family know. You know, I'm going to go join the police. I'm going for training. And I told them, if you guys don't want me to throw you in jail, then don't do anything dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I but but I've had to over over the years. I've had you know cousins I grew up with who, who wouldn't talk to me for five years. But my mindset was always well. This is what I do. You do what you do. This puts the food on my table, and I, this is how I support my family. And again, go back if you don't want me to throw you in jail, then don't do anything dumb. <laughs> Uh, the other big one too is pension. That's a big part of our retention. Um, because we're a federal program, we can't get into a what's referred to as a special forces pension program here in Alberta. So basically what we pay into right now is a glorified RRSP. And after 25 years, it's gonna be tough for anybody to retire just on that. So we're taking steps now where we're gonna, you know, when we hire people, unless things change, we're gonna have a financial advisor to sit with our new people and give them options on what they can do to help them. And we're really hoping that if we get this essential service designation, that's gonna be a whole problem that will go away. Questions? I, I tried to get through that as fast as I could. I I, I, I got the five minute and then I got. I have to do. Uh, I have to read out something. Okay. Questions. Next week, our speaker will be James Burns, speaking about climate, energy, sustainability. Where are we and where do we go? Now it's question time. Now we'd ask those who are waiting to ask questions to line up against this wall. So Rianne, maybe you might want to. Yeah, I'll get, let, give them an opportunity to line up there. Uh, please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes or stories, and we expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, only those legibly written and signed will be asked by myself. Okay, so we can start with the first question. Uh, hi, I'm Maria Fitzpatrick, and uh, 32 and a half years working in federal corrections. Mm. Uh, so uh, I appreciate, first of all, the presentation you gave, and uh, also I want to thank you for the service that you've provided, uh, not just in your community, but for all of Alberta. So my question is specific about operations, and uh, as you said, you've had to arrest 
uh, or take into custody, you know, family, friends, whatever. Uh, with the opioid crisis, uh, how are you handling um, that situation in the community when this is you know, your your cousin's son or daughter or whatever. And um, because they are high on the drugs or they're unconscious, how are you handling that um, on a personal level? Because those kinds of things affect you. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle that on a personal level? Um. Yeah, on a personal level, um, even myself, I have family from, I'm married into the, um, into the nation, so my wife and all her family are from uh, the nation as well. And um, um, like all families, we've been dealing with uh, loved ones that have addictions. Um, opioid crisis has just absolutely uh, destroyed the world, basically. I can't even say it's just Alberta or Canada, but definitely on the States as well. We have, we have family and friends down in, uh, just across the border in, in, in Browning and in Montana and that way. Um, the, we have a job to do. Um, personal feelings aside, we understand that this is devastating families uh, at a, a completely different level than just a, uh, an enforcement way. Um, the opioid crisis from day one, we've always kind of established the police can do only so much um, when we look at the social and economic um, challenges that come along with, um, with addictions and, and um, generational trauma and um, everything that um, trickles down. What is the root cause of all these addictions uh, without fixing those or understanding those? You know, the opioid crisis is just a, a, um, an outlet to that, to that, to that trauma. Um, we, uh, our officers are doing an amazing job getting as much information and intel and uh, like the chief mentioned we had a search warrant where drugs and firearms were seized that were um, that were fentanyl was involved um, and whatnot our officers um, are dealing with a lot we're seeing some burnout we're seeing a lot of um, uh, stresses that um, uh, some organizations or some sorry some occupations don't deal with uh, nowhere near some what our, our, our colleagues in the health and, and, and fire and EMS that are responding to these on a daily. We get called maybe to a, a, a fraction of what they're responding to, so I can only imagine what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, it's just, it's, we just gotta take it day by day, understand that we have a job to do. Um, try our best and, um, and uh, have the, the compassion and to, to uh, get them to uh, uh, back them, bring them back home. In traditional sense, fix the trauma, fix the addiction, bring them back home. My name is Mark Gettle. Apparently, soon you will be mandated to wear body cam, and I'm just wondering how do you feel that about that? How do you feel about the province telling you, mandating you to do something, uh, and who's going to pay for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good question um, fortunately we were looking at that already we, we we started our research on it and again it's a it's a costly endeavor as far as as far as going to answer your question about how we feel about the province mandating it I mean you know we we, we have to abide by provincial standards policing standards and if that's what they put in there then we we, we really have no choice but to go with it. Um, we're just waiting and we're interested in, interested in seeing how the procurement process is gonna go. Um, I mean, we were listening to, we're watching something this morning and Ed, Edmonton Police Service, their budget for their body-worn cameras with training for all staff and civilian employees is, they're, they have a five million dollar budget just for that. And that's half our budget. It's half my budget. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, I, I hope that answers your question. But that's that's where we are, and it's it's pricey. And like I said, we're just waiting to see how the pre procurement process is going to go, and 
It's funny because once that was announced, I think we've had three, <laughs> three companies contact us and say, hey, what's all this going on? So. Okay. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, this was almost touched on as the last question, but uh, Chief Buxkin, you, you said 52% of the funding is federal, 48% is provincial, and you talked a lot about the relations with the feds. What's your relationship with the province as far as money goes and I'm going to ask you to go out in the limb and, be, and forecast something here. What would you see would happen were the province of Alberta to uh, essentially kick the RCMP out of the province? I do it to me, but we have the same thoughts. We do have the same thoughts. Um, I'm a lot shorter than both these gentlemen, so. Just gonna, um, well, how how the Alberta government decide to roll out their provincial police force or police service, however they want to, that's up to them. Um, we have been made assurances by Minister Shandro and Minister Ellis that that rollout will not affect our self-administered First Nations police services in Alberta. Um, it actually only encourages more um, Indigenous communities to start their own police services. Um, so how I know it's going to be very costly and whether if that's going to be something that's attainable um, for the provincial government, again, just like the body-worn cameras, who's going to pay for it all. Uh, we're, we're interested to see what the details look like and how the rollout's going to be with the provincial police service. Um, but um, a as it it affects the Blood Tribe Police Service um, and First Nations Police Services. It's n we're told it's not going to. Um, well, what do they say about trusting the government? Just be careful. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we want to make sure that uh, everything's um, on the up and up and um, uh, our funding is not going to be affected that way. It'll only m more likely give us more strength because the more self-administered police services pop up in Alberta, the strength uh, of unities is, is a lot harder to drive those negotiating tables and bring the bureaucrats to the table as opposed to third line the down. That's just getting them the coffee. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hopefully that answered your question, Ken. Do you, you want me, you want me, you want, well you didn't want the PC answer, but you got the PC answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm shorter than you even. Uh, uh, Mary Shillington, and thank you very much f to both of you for your presentation. I'm presently in a book study group ca uh, called uh, Indigenous Rights, and, and it, it uh, reminds me again, as a um, person that comes from the settler community, how, how poorly we've treated the Aboriginal p people in our in our country, and I offer my apologies from me. Thank you. Um, so I know, uh, having worked with Indigenous people as a counselor, how much the residential school uh, issues have affected all people uh, of Indigenous Métis and Inuit, and um, so I'm wondering what's happening with your people who are coming in as, uh, as police officers and how that impacts them and what kind of support is available to you because of course that costs money if there's counseling and so on. What, what kind of support are you able to offer to them? Sorry, um, as far as support goes, we we try and support our, support our officers and staff as best we can. Um, you know, we're 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 paying for extra visits to you know health mental health professionals. Um, we're also going to moving moving along with a trauma informed type policing. So, you know, when you go deal with somebody, you understand why they behave the way they do or, or act a certain way. Um, you know, for speaking for myself, being from the reserve and, you know, grow, growing up, I, I always knew about the residential schools, but it wasn't until 
I reached probably about 18, 19, where I really started, you know, paying a closer attention to it. And, you know, nowadays what we're dealing with are the residual effects. I mean, you have grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, you know, whether it's, you know, and that, that you know, just, just to be clear, that's kind of, that's probably the result of their addictions. But when you're ripped from your home when you're four years old and you're thrown into a school without any kind of parental affection or guidance from, you know, whether it's parents or grandparents, you don't grow up with it. You don't have that in your life. You don't have that, that trait or that knowledge. And that's passed on to your children and that's what we're dealing with now. And it's, it's, it's really quite sad and I don't want to say it's becoming a norm. It should, it should have never been a norm, but that's the unfortunate thing is that's where we are right now. And until we find a effective way of healing and dealing with it, 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 it will continue. So. Sorry, I'll just set that to my height. <laughs> Thanks. So, good afternoon. Thank you for coming by. I appreciate it as much as everybody else does. And uh, my name is Dan Kordakowski, and I graduated from the criminal justice program in the year 1997. So, from 1995 to 1997, I took the program at the college. And uh, yeah, to be honest, it was always my dream to become an officer, um, help people, and uh, didn't have that happen. I was diagnosed with mental illness, and uh, what I do now is I public speak and I educate people about what it's like to live with mental illness. So that's something that I enjoy doing, and, and it's something I'm going to do for as long as I possibly can do. And I just want to know, um, what credentials do you value the most as dealing with the programs that the college will say, uh, people graduating from the program, as I read in the paper and uh, watch on the news that they're getting classes through the college that um, study about Indigenous studies and uh, what do you think about the cream of crop getting the jobs first and the people that had to do like myself and keep on applying time after time after time and then facing the rejection that comes with it but my view is that life experience is uh, the best indicator and we can never undervalue life experience so thank you thank you Question on recruiting, hey, look at that. Um, so Lethbridge College has, uh, well we approached Lethbridge College two years ago um, about helping us create an Indigenous Studies uh, micro-credential for Indigenous policing. And that's for um, experienced officers working uh, for the Blood Tribe, but we're hoping that with Lethbridge College's assistance, it'll be you know sent out provincial, nationwide, to kind of get the understanding, awareness, and education of what it means to work in an Indigenous community. So if we can, you know, the more awareness, the more education for those um, students going through the Lethbridge College program, uh, the better. They do have a, um, uh, a micro-credential course called Nitsitipi Proficiency, and that's specific to the Blood Tribe and the Blackfoot Territory. Um, so. When we look at recruiting practices specifically for the Blood Tribe Police Service, what we look at is something called an organizational fit. So it's a, it's a, it's a combination of a lot of different things, life experience, um, where they grow up, whether they are Indigenous or not. Uh, basically, we want to have people that uh, we can see them with us for a long period of time. And like the, the chief mentioned on one of the slides talking about stepping stones and whatnot like that, we, we're, we started changing our recruiting practices to uh, start identifying those traits that we can uh, identify people that are going to stay with us for the long long haul. Um, that's maybe if they are Indigenous that helps but also um, if their grassroots are in southern Alberta. 
And uh, I don't know about you, you, you find people when you grow up in Lethbridge, you try to leave it, but somehow it sucks you back in. So um, that's how I felt, right? So like, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a strong pull, Southern Alberta, I don't think there's a, a, a place like, like it nationwide where, where you kind of have the, uh, um, the mountains to the, to, the, to the west and prairies and just, you know, Alberta, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we're just finding those grassroots people that um, um, make home here and we can see them stay with us for a long period of time. That's where our, our recruiting practices go. Those are the traits we're really looking for. Everything else is everybody makes mistakes. Everybody um, trips and falls and they get up and, and learning from them. We, we're not looking for perfect people. It's impossible to find a perfect human being. Um, so why try? So we just want to make sure that they're, they're good and uh, they, they're going to be with us for a while. Hopefully that answered it. Um, th thank you. Uh, I think you did a really good job. You just passed the short course in public speaking. <laughs> anyway, I actually have two questions. And I talked to a friend of mine who, part, who talked to a friend of mine who's on another reserve, and he gave me the opioid death numbers uh, in the last two years, and it kind of shocked me scared me, um, and I don't know what your numbers are, but maybe you can tell us. The other thing is, you know, is there a light at the end of the tunnel where your community is working and they're going to inform you and maybe give you information before stuff goes wrong? And, you know, you, you, you can't sort of be pushing water uphill all the time. So I want to know if you guys see something good coming along for you. Your name, Ian. Sorry. Sorry? Your name. I thought I said it. Ian Hurdle. <laughs> um, I can't give you an exact number on how many people have passed in this last year. Do 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 the opioids or overdoses, whether with, with whichever drug it was, but I thought it's substantially higher than for for the population base. Um, to answer your second question, you know, when when it first started, and I don't think I'm wrong in saying this, but I think we were ground zero when it started. And, you know, Rianne and I were working one day, and, and this was right at the beginning. We went to a house, and, you know, six children were left orphaned that day. So it's, it's, it's been a long battle. It's going to continue to be a battle. You know, I'm, there's, no, there's, there's no other way of putting it or describing it. Until un, until we heal as a people, and as a reserve. And fortunately, we're getting a lot of support from from chief and council. We we, we always have. You know, I I, I don't want anyone to think that we're not getting any type of support from them, from them. Uh, currently, right now, we were basically declared war on the drugs and. We're concentrating more on the enforcement side. And the unfortunate part of this, because of our resources, we're always a pro uh, reactive service rather than being proactive. Uh, that, and that's not optimal. That's not an optimal way to operate when you have these kind of social problems. But unfortunately, that's, that's just the way it is. And, 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 and we've learned to operate in that manner and again which is not which is not optimal we're, we're not providing the really kind of policing that the reserve needs but that's just that, that's just the nature of the beast right now and that's why we're hoping to get some essential service designation and you know we will be provided more resources and we can you know b b battle this this uh Epide epidemic a little a little harder a, a, actually a lot harder um, but we are taking steps now as a police service to 
disrupt and make it make it tough for the people out there who are feeding our feeding their own people their poison they're basically killing their own people and I'm I've never stood for that and I'm not gonna stand for that so I, I hope that answers your question but I mean that's about the best I could answer for you Hi, gentlemen. My name is Henning Mundel. And my question relates to cooperation. First, uh, just formal or maybe informal. On the one hand, in terms of incarceration on the reserve vis-a-vis -vis the correctional center here. And the other is vis-a-vis -vis the native population in Lethbridge that may run afoul of the law in relation we're talking about opioid and temptation to drugs and alcohol. Um, what is your interaction with the Lesbridge City Police in that connection? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, that's a two-parter. Um, the the um, the cooperation is like. When I, when I stood up here to, and I, I said it's not, it's not a co an enforcement thing that, that can bring us out of this opioid epidemic, uh, it's going to require every basically uh, social program, health, um, education, uh, everything that, uh, that we can throw at it to kind of bring awareness, bring education, prevention, and then tail end enforcement. Um, what we, what the nation did a, a year ago when we were right in the peak of the uh, opioid pandemic, it started back in 2015, right? Yeah, so we're, we're almost 10 years into it now. But um, uh, they, they had a task force, and what the task force did was a wraparound service, understanding that the issue was more than just an enforcement issue, where they had uh, people from the Department of Health with uh, addictions counseling and the crisis um, and support services, because we knew that for us to be able to get out of the opioid pandemic and help the people that are um, addicted, we have to understand the root cause of where the trauma is and why they turn to drugs. Um, and that's what the wraparound service helped, helped identify where the trauma is from, where the, the need to go um, to drugs opposed to their other outlets um, and give them the support they need. Um, and it's worked um, and we have a lot of individuals on the nation with lived experience uh, in the past um, that have shared their knowledge and shared their, their stories and, and help others unfold. On the other hand, there's people that are not in it for the trauma, they're in it for criminal organizations, money and whatnot. Now those ones are easy to deal with because there's it's 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 a it's a violent and abrasive and intrusive act to to, to knock down somebody's door, arrest them and, and do it that way. So we, we, we save that for the people that are not interested in healing and not interested in growing and not interested in uh, anything else than what they see. Um, Correction-wise, um, the community corrections program in Standoff is no longer exists. It's just probation and parole, so everything comes to the remand center here in, in Lethbridge um, Correctional Center. Our relationship with Lethbridge Police Service has always been strong. We've, I've always identified them as our bigger brothers uh, because they've always kind of been there to kind of help us when um, when um, certain things just we just didn't have the tools, didn't have the ability. They're there for us when we, we need the training and the support of our members that uh, we can't provide ourselves because, again, the funding affects it all. They have the specialized individuals that can help. Can it be stronger? Absolutely. We can always achieve, uh, we can always achieve more, especially to assist the, the, uh, the nation and the indigenous population in Lethbridge. Um, and um, Chief and Council are, are, have not forgotten about them. Uh, they talk about them all the time and how they can best support them. Um, there's groups that are popping up, like the Sage Clan, that uh, go around and help. Uh, the Watch is, again, very instrumental on, on helping the vulnerable population walking around, making sure what, what they need, what they need. Um, and then I think um, a combination of um, buy-in from City Council. I'm a Lethbridge resident, so I can say it, uh, to, to uh, help um, um, find a 
a long-term solution to help them, opposed to ostracize them and uh, shame them, because uh, that's not something that's ever worked in the past and it's not going to work going forward. This will be the last question. Um, Ken Sears again. And I wasn't trying to set you up to say snotty things about the uh, Alberta government because I'm quite capable of doing that myself. <laughs> <coughs> but there were two points and maybe just as a matter of clarification of what I was asking earlier. First off, <coughs> the provincial government is just finishing a process whereby I believe it's a third of policing costs in the province have been <coughs> devolved down to the municipalities. I can you think of any reason why they wouldn't follow the same pattern with uh, with tribal um, police forces? And the second thing is, and this is probably more to the chief, um, the blood band is the largest, like what, twelve thousand people? You said most of the bands in in Alberta are much smaller than that. They're isolated. Do you, uh, why would you be optimistic that they would be able to establish and support? Uh, local police forces. I'll answer that. Yes. Uh, just to answer the second part, when you're talking about the smaller, smaller nations in Alberta, I, I, I think what's going to happen there is they're going to go to a treaty-based model. I've I, I've worked in northern Alberta where they've they had a police service. But we police three different reserves. And as recently as late last month, I was speaking with uh, an ex, ex chief of police that I worked for, who now does some consulting. In. And again, it's looking like in northern Alberta, along with the, with the smaller reserves that are that, that's what they're looking at again is going into a treaty based model where you're going to have five or six different reserves who are all going to band together and they'll have one big police service. So I, I, I hope that I hope that answers your question, but that, that that's how that's gonna be dealt with I I think. I, I believe that's how it is. The first part of the question was it around the funding? Yes. Uh, specifically First Nations or the, the funding the funding for has been devolved down from the provincial government down to municipalities. Out, uh, you know, for, for just municipality mm -hmm. police. Um, and I just, I would worry that that same pattern, that same model of putting more and more demands on the band would, 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 uh, would um, yeah, so, so this is the, so w w whenever anyone talks about our, where we fall under, they always, push us to the federal side. That's why we're not a, we were not considered um, under the Municipal Governments Act. That's why we're not uh, um, able to join the Special Forces Pension Plan, because they're all provincially funded and they're all provincial mandated. So I think we are more on the federal side. And, the, and Alberta has done their part already by establishing that we are an essential service within the borders of Alberta. So they said that we are an essential service, but now it's the federal government to give us that essential designation. But that also comes with essential based funding as well that, that that essential funding helps come from the same funding that the RCMP get um, that um, probably not as robust not as deep but uh, but uh, the pro so we just need to get away from the program to actually get essential based funding then I don't think that whatever the prov province do will affect us as, as greatly as what the federal government uh, kicks in Thank you very much, uh, Grant and Rianne. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> now, just to, before we close, is there any take home message that each of you would like to provide us today? Uh, like Rayanne, I live here in Lethbridge as well. When when I move back, you know, would I like to live on a reserve? Absolutely. Would I like to get my 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 children more involved in the community and you know learn learn the culture a little more? 
I would love to, but you know, there's tons of other social ills on the reserve. You know, for 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 us when we moved out here, we you know basically you couldn't, you couldn't find any housing on the reserve, and. I moved out of my parents' house when I was 17, and I'm now moving back in at this age. So, so, so we ended up buying a house here. We live here in Lethbridge, so this is, you know, home. Um, if there's anything that I can say, you know, and it's, it's just, it's just simple humanity. I mean, we're all humans. We're all people. At the end of the day, we're all the same. You know, we have. We all have our shortcomings, we all have our faults. I'm no better than anybody else here. And so when, when I look at some of our, some of my people on the streets, I, I, I feel bad for them. I've, I've never felt embarrassed about it though. And so, you know, if anything, look at people that way too. I mean, I've, that, that, that's how I've always conducted myself with my job. And you know it's gone into my personal life as well. So, you know, Finn, we're at the end of the day, we're all humans. That's all I can say. You know, treat each other well. Yeah, you don't follow. Just be better humans. So <laughs> that's ditto. So thanks. Thank <laughs> you.